Alright, alright, alright. Next up is, of course, Iron Man. Yes, everybody else's favorite. When we watched it this time, actually, in between, we watched the alternate opening to The Incredible Hulk, and then we watched, uh, we took the sort of opening for it, and then sort of swapped it around so that it yeah, in chronological to, to order. to keep up with the chronological thing yeah, I'm trying yeah. to do here. I love that one day, I don't know if they would ever do this, but see, like, a TV presentation where they do what we've done here, take all the stuff and uh, rearrange it into one long marathon movie thing. Yeah. And also drop in a few deleted scenes here and there, which yes. is really nice. Uh, so anyway, for Iron Man, uh, this was the one that kicked things off. And yeah. is, you know, generally considered to be one of the uh, best superhero origin stories on film. One thing I didn't mention with Cap is, like, there's a lot of references to like other Marvel stuff, including to the other movies in that movie. I don't know if you had made this movie much earlier, like in the 90s or the 70s, you probably wouldn't do all that, especially yeah. if you're not sure if it's going to be interconnected with the other stuff. Um, this movie has some stuff, but um, like not as much, and what is there is just kind of only references to the other movies in hindsight, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, like talking about to Howard Stark's participation in the war. I don't know if they had in mind when they made this, that they were going to have Howard Stark in the Cat movie. Yeah, Somehow yeah. I doubt that, or they would have been more clear about that. In Avengers, he says, uh, about Captain America, this is a guy my dad never shut up about. Like, well, that's <laughs> new. So this is the first movie released in this new Marvel Cinematic Universe. It, it's not too, it doesn't feel, as far as referencing the bigger Marvel Universe, it's not too different from basically any other movie uh, adapted from the Marvel Universe made before that, like the Daredevil movie or the first Hulk movie or stuff like that. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they're trying to keep things pretty uh, simple. Like, yeah. as each movie comes out, then they start, it starts getting more and more connected. Well, they do have the sort of reference to the Avengers at the very, very end and the yeah. most great stinger. It still, it didn't quite feel like a whole new ball game. It just felt like, okay, here is a really good superhero movie. Now, of course, the thing that makes the whole movie work, as it turns out, is Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. Now let's rewind the clock a bit. Uh, this is at the tail end of uh, this particular actor having a having a very rough bunch of years. Uh, he was kind of in and out of jail and rehab yeah. and so on, and uh, nobody was really sure if he was ever going to make um, if he was ever going to make a proper comeback. If he was ever going to clean himself up long enough to, you know, uh, become a box office draw again. But then this came out, and he had really done it. Yeah, I think yeah. part of it is that uh, he could probably identify with Tony Stark yeah. uh, on a unique level uh, with all the stuff he had gone through yeah, yeah. and all the demons he had had to battle, that, yeah, he, yeah. that uh, Stark had had to battle too. Over time, it almost seems like since, since this movie, the real guy, Robert Downey Jr., has become more like this character yeah. in real life. <laughs> Weird. As he says in Tropic Thunder, I'm the dude playing the dude Ooh, disguised as another dude. dude. This came out a little bit after Marvel was uh, playing around with their um, with their straight-to-video animated movies. Mm -hmm. and, one, and one of the first ones was The Invincible Iron Man, Ugh. which is one of the worst ones in that set, straight yeah. up. Uh, if it was a pilot for an Iron Man show, I don't know, maybe, but looking back on it, and especially compared to this, it blows. Yeah. It does the origin all wrong. Especially, you know, trying to mix in the Mandarin with that and like all this other stuff. It's like, okay, if you wanted to tell this story, you shouldn't have done the origin because they don't go together and this the whole origin is sort of upside down and backwards. Yeah, now they do hint at uh, the Mandarin in this film with the uh, the terrorist group that captures him in the case is called the Ten Rings, presumably with a plan that, okay, eventually we'll reveal that Mandarin is their leader, He was so they get to tie him into the origin that way. And they pay that off in Iron Man 3, sort of. But it's uh, not the way you'd expect, but we'll get to that with Iron Man 3. Yeah. And we're just kind of looking back and it's like, you know, uh, uh, Rhodey's in the cave with him. Uh, we find out that he already built a bunch of armors before that. And that's why he was able to build the cave. You see the, um, the writers of, the, of that movie sort of explaining all this, and it's like, you really didn't have faith in the material. Yeah. Like, that was made practically in-house. But, I don't know. It's, you know, it just wasn't as good. Like this, this is very good. Yeah. Oh. And, and, and I feel like it kind of uh, unravels a bit in the third yeah, act. Yeah, It's like, okay, because 
because every movie has to end with a big throwdown between with our hero and the designated villain every time and sometimes the build up to that is not quite what it should be uh, I, I see this way too often and this this movie suffers from it where the villain just um, just basically goes psycho and wants to destroy everything instead of like what would make more sense is if the villain has some kind of larger scheme that the hero has to prevent and then and you can get the fight you can spin the fight out from that yeah, yeah. But, I really like the scene where you know but, you know, but here the big scheme is the ironmonger armor yeah yeah it is kind of an accurate adaptation of the comics where Obadiah Stane who was instead a business rival you know did a, like all kinds of stuff and then eventually he done ironmonger armor and was defeated so having him do that only at the end actually kind of yeah. you know it fits um, in the broad strokes it makes sense to do it that way I definitely like the scene where you know um, Obadiah um, paralyzes Tony and then pulls the arc reactor out of him while Such you know, a great while, you know, lecturing him about uh, how how evil he is. That's you know, probably it's kind of all downhill after that. But that's such a very effective, very tense scene where you know when Tony realizes who the bad guy has been all along. Yeah, and and, then, uh, and you also see our hero in a state of vulnerability with the villain towering over him. Yeah, and of course, then you got Jeff Bridges as Stane, who is yeah, excellent. Yeah. He's a real surprise. Jeff Bridges doesn't really look in this movie like he usually looks. He shaves all of his hair, and he's got you know the big villain goatee. I feel like the ending could have been a little improved, and it's a little. Um, but like the, f the first two thirds of the movie are so good that it almost doesn't even yeah, yeah. matter. I think my favorite scene in the movie is when you know Tony is watching the news and with like all the unrest overseas and Nigel Mary is like working on the gauntlet and it's just like uh, no dialogue and you see him sort of transform into the superhero right there. Somebody gonna do something? Yeah, I'm gonna do something. So that is Iron Man and uh, on to the rest of phase one.